the people's next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call uh, Howard Ronald Beagler to the stand. Feel free to stretch if anybody wishes. Thanks. Sir, if you could approach, I need to give you an oath before you testify. We have a black cord stretched across your walkway, too. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, thank you, sir. If you have a seat in the green chair by the microphone, please. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Can you please tell the jury your full name and spell your last name? It's Howard Ronald Beigler, Jr. Last name is spelled B-E-I-G-L-E-R. Where do you live? Um, Pensacola, Florida. Did you know Paige Bergfeld? Yes. How did you know her? Um, I was married to her, and we were friends for years. When did you first meet her? In 89, I believe. Do you remember about how old she was then? 14, maybe. Did you start dating her then? No. Did you, when did you start dating her? A couple years after that. When did you ultimately get engaged to her? Around 94. And then when were you married to her? In 95. Where did all this occur? In Denver. Did you go to high school in Denver? Yes. And did she as well? Yes. How long were you married? Um, around two years. Do you remember when you got divorced? 97. Did you have any kids together? No. Were you aware she had kids? She didn't at the time. Did she later have kids? Yes. Did you know them? Yes. Uh, did you stay in touch with her over the years from pretty consistently from the time you got divorced until uh, she went, well, were you aware she went missing? Yes. Okay. Did you stay in touch with her consistently from the time you were divorced until she went missing? For the most part, yes. In 2007, what was your relationship like? Um, we were back together. Where were you living then? In Aurora, Colorado. And she was living in? Grand Junction. Did you talk to her often? Every day. Um, did she confide in you about things? Yes. Do you recall what your phone number was back then, your cell phone number? No. If I said it, would it? Probably. Would, would it re refresh your memory? Does 720-404-5177 sound familiar? Sorry, could you give that to me one more time? Please? Yes, sir. Thank you. 720-404-5177. That Thank sounds you. familiar. Thank you. Did you switch phones around the time that she went missing? Yes. Can you explain that? What happened? Um, my contract was running out, and I, was switching, I switched phones the very next day after she went missing just to upgrade and switch phones. Okay. I had a little bit writing out left on that contract and the new one was just starting up. And you said you talked to her every day. Was that by phone? Yes. So would the phone records show that that 720 number that we just talked about leading up to the time she went missing and then a different phone number for you after that? Correct. Did you give both of those numbers to the police? Yes. Did you know what Paige's businesses were? 
Yes. What were they? She um, had a few rental houses. She taught dance classes. She worked for Pampered Chef. And she sold baby slings. Did she have an escort business as well? And the escort business. Did she talk to you about each of those businesses? Yes. Do you know if she had multiple telephones? I think she had two cell phones and a landline. Was one of her cell phones more for the escort business? Yes. And then the other cell phone, do you know if that was business as Personal well? and business. Okay. Was it for different businesses than the escort business? Um, I would say so, probably more for her other businesses, and she had the other one exclusively more for the adult entertainment. And then you mentioned the landline. Are you talking about a home phone? Home phone. Did you provide all of those numbers to the sheriff's office in 2007? I believe I did. Did you meet with her uh, on the day of her disappearance? Yes. Can you describe how that came about? Um, we often met in Vail or at my house in Aurora, or usually we met in Vail or Eagle. So um, we just decided to meet, meet again. When did you decide that, if you recall? A few days prior. We were deciding whether Tuesday or Thursday or what day would work better and then for convenience. And then ultimately you did decide to meet her on Thursday? Yes. Do you recall if you talked to her in that, that morning? I did. What was the purpose of talking to her in the morning? Um, to time um, our departure from where we were coming from so to, she, to so we could time it to where we would meet at the same time. Was it at roughly the same amount of drive time from each direction? It was about the, exactly the same drive time. And that's to meet in Eagle? Eagle. Eagle. What time did you ultimately leave Grand Junction, excuse me, leave Denver, the Denver area? Um, I'd say around 10.30 maybe. Do you recall if anything happened on your way uh, to Eagle that delayed you? Um, some traffic. Where was that? Um, after Vail, between Eagle and Vail. What time did you ultimately get to Eagle? Probably around 1. Was she there? Yes. She got there before you did? I spoke to her and she was waiting for me. You spoke to her by telephone? Yes. Do you recall what she was wearing? Um, some kind of flowered top and some open teal sandals and some jean shorts. Where did you go when you got there? Um, Walk down by the stream from the parking lot. Do you recall where the, what parking lot you went to? It was the main visitor center when you get off that has the outdoor museum, as an outdoor museum and like a train and a little park. And there's a stream nearby? Yeah, it's the river, I believe. There were rafters going down it. So the river, I believe. And so did you both park there or did you get in the same car? We both parked there. And you said you went down by the stream? Yep. What did you do? Um, we just put out a blanket and um, sat there and looked at pictures. Of what? I brought pictures up from the past and she brought pictures from her trip to the Bahamas with the kids. Was that trip recently? I believe she, she just returned um, I think a week prior, I think something like that. And then you said you put a blanket down. Did you remain there the whole time? No. What else did you do? We went to Subway and brought it back to the blanket. Did you do anything else? Did you walk around or? Walk we walked around? around to the museum and looked at all that and just walked around. Did you kiss? Yes. Where did that occur? Um,
Probably on the blanket. Did you at some point realize you needed to go somewhere more private? Yes, we um, took the car down um, several yards to find somewhere private, but it was fenced off. Then what did you do? We went back and found a spot further back in the, in the woods for more privacy. Were you intimate with her that day? Yes. Do you recall um, if her cell phone was ringing that day? Yes, it was ringing. Was it ringing a lot, a little? Do you remember about how many times? It was ringing several times, which was normal. Um, did she take the calls or did she let them go to voicemail? She let them go to voicemail. Do you know if she spoke to anyone while you were with her? I believe she called Jess while we were together. What time did you leave? Around 7 that evening. 7 p.m.? Mm hmm And where did she go? Which direction? She went toward Grand Junction. Where did you go? I went the opposite toward Denver. Do you remember if she left around 7 as well? We left at the exact same time because we were behind each other and we split off right where you get on 70. So you recall seeing her actually going the other direction? Left her go on the on-ramp, oh, yep. Did she tell you what her plans were when you were with her in Eagle? Did she tell you what her plans were for the rest of that day? To get home to the kids. At the point that she left you, she did not describe any other plans? No. Did you talk to her at all later that evening? I talked to her before I arrived home, and I believe she had just gotten into Grand Junction. Do you remember about what time that was? It would have to be probably around 8.30 or 9. Just based on how long it takes to yeah. get back? Do you know about for how long you spoke? Um, I remember that um, I couldn't reach her because of the cell phone signal wasn't coming through. And I think that she had tried to call me too, but um, until we got back into our cities, there was no um, coverage. And then once you actually spoke to her, do you remember about how long that conversation was? Maybe 15, 20 minutes. Do you remember what you talked about? Um, talked about a traffic jam in Grand Junction and did she seem agitated about that? Um, no more than anybody would be when they closed the road because of an accident and they have to find a detour. She was describing that yeah. she was experiencing that at that particular time? Yes. Okay. Um, did she tell you anything about her plans that evening at that point? She said that she was going to probably go see a client and then maybe two. Did that surprise you? A little bit. Why? Because um, all she talked about was going home to the kids. That's all she wanted to do all afternoon. So from your understanding of the conversation, her plans changed from the time you left her in Eagle until the time she got home? Yes. Do you remember how that call ended? I would say how any phone call would end. Just talk to you st tomorrow. Standard goodbye yeah. sort of thing. Did she, well, you said you were aware of Models, Inc. Yes. Um, did she carry a bag with a change of clothes with her routinely? Yes. Do you know if she had it that day? I assume she probably did. You don't. You don't specifically recall. Well, I, you know, um, you know, if the weather turned chilly up in, you know, mm -hmm. she might have had something to put something else on. Did she change before seeing clients? Um, yes. 
What sorts of clothes would she wear to see clients? It would vary from an evening gown to, you know, on down from there. So more dre more dressy than jeans. More dressy suits. to... Okay. Did you talk to her on Friday? No. Did, did you try to talk to her on Friday? I don't think I tried to call her on Friday. Um, when did you next try to call her? Saturday. And would that have been with the new phone? Um, probably. So the phone records would show your new phone, not that? I believe phone. it was the new phone. Okay. Um, do you know how you tried to get a hold of her? Did you call one of the phone, one of her phones? I called her main phone. Her main cell phone? Mm -hmm. Yes? Correct, yes. Sorry, we're recording, so I need you to sure. say yes or no. Um, so did it? She didn't answer? No, went straight to voicemail. Was that unusual? Yes. She would take your calls typically? Yes. Did you call the house phone at some point? Yes. Did you talk to anyone? Talk to Jess. And did you direct Jess to do anything? Um, I told her to when she told me that Paige hadn't been home yet, I told her to immediately call 911. Did you leave any voice messages on Paige's, Paige's uh, message machine, her, her, her voicemail? I believe I did. Did you ultimately call 911 yourself? I called the Mesa County Sheriff's Office. I didn't call 911. Okay. I just called to talk to somebody at the, at the Sheriff's Office. May I approach her? Yes, sir. Sir, I'm going to show you what's marked People's Exhibit 200, and for the record, I've previously shown defense counsel this. Thank you. It's my signature. Sir, do you recognize that disc? Yes. How do you recognize it? Um, because I signed it in the first trial. Okay, so you you've previously listened to that. I did. Disc, and then after Your you. Order, may we approach? Yes, you may. Feel free to stretch, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, objection is sustained, so you're to disregard the witness's last answer. Furthermore, you're uh, instructed that you are not to consider that there was a previous trial, and you're also instructed that it's not relevant uh, whether or not there was a previous trial to any decisions that you are to make in this trial. Thank you. You can proceed, Mr. Rubenstein. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Beigler, so that disc, you've, you've previously listened to that, is that correct? That's correct. And then after you listened to it, you initialed it so that you would recognize it later? Yes. And when you listened to it, was that a complete and accurate uh, copy of the call that you made to report uh, yes. page missing? Your Honor, at this time, I'd move to admit People's Exhibit 200. Do you have an objection, Ms. Smith? No. All right, People's Number 200 is admitted. Uh, do you recall if uh, Ms. Bergfeld had a office? She did have an office. And was that for her Models, Inc. business? Yes. Do you recall where that office was? No. Do you remember telling law enforcement it was um, over near the airport? Um, that rings a bell. If you would, if you said it back then, would that have been correct? Yes. Do you know if she had any other people that worked with her in Models Inc? She did. Who, do you recall names at all? No. Do you recall by description? Was there an older woman that occasionally worked with her? Yes. And was that somebody that she sent out? Yes. Do you know if she had any males that she sent out to do various jobs? She didn't. Do you recall that because she talked to you about whether or not you would consider that? Yes. And what did she want, what did she ask you to do? Just to escort. Did she ever ask you if you would dance at bachelorette parties for her, for mm -hmm. her business? Yes. What kind of a car did she have when she was with you in Eagle? A Ford Escort or Focus, Ford Focus. Do you recall if that was a two-door or a four-door? Um, I believe it was four-door. Okay. And is that sort of a smaller sedan-looking car? I'd say a very small sedan, yeah. Okay. Yes. Like a compact car? Yeah, compact. And I'm sorry, did you say the color? It was red. Red. Okay. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions for this witness. Thank you. Cross-examination, Ms. Smith. Good morning. Morning. Okay. I want to just begin by um, getting the timeline down um, from from that Thursday that you saw Ms. Bergfeld. You parted company with her after 7 p.m., right? At or around 7 p.m. Okay. Now, so not after? It could have been a couple minutes after. It was at or around there. And the two of you parted ways in Eagle, Colorado? Correct. And that's about two hours from Grand Junction? Yeah, it's about the halfway point. Okay. And so is it about two hours? Two from, hours, yes. From Denver, two hours from Grand Junction? Correct. And you talked to her again when she was back in Grand Junction? Correct. And that was around 9 p.m.? Yes. And at this time, she's expressing some frustration about a road being closed, right? 
Yes. Due to an accident? Yes. And she indicated to you that she had to take an alternate route? Yes. And it's during this conversation that you learn about her intention to go see an, at least one more client? Yes. Maybe two? Correct. And so this is at about 9 p.m., right? Yes. And at this point when you're talking to her, not only do you learn that she is about, that, that she intends to see a client, it's your impression that she's just about to meet with her first client, right? I don't know, just about to meet. I don't know if she was going to try to go home first. Okay. Um, I believe that her intention was to go take care of the clients first, then okay. go home. And so is your impression that maybe she was changing for this client appointment or maybe had just changed? It's possible. Okay. Well, you spoke with law enforcement in this case, right? Correct. Okay, and that was an investigator that came to Aurora to interview you? Correct. And you interviewed with that investigator for over two hours, right? Yes. And that was a couple weeks after Ms. Bergfeld went missing? Yes. And you told that investigator at that time that it was your impression that she was in the process of changing or had just changed when you guys were talking at 9 p.m.? Um, if she was seeing a client, she was probably changing into something. Okay. And it was your impression during this, I forget how long you said, how long was this conversation, 10 to 20 minutes? 15, 20 minutes. 15, 20 minutes. And it was your impression during this 15 to 20 minute phone call that she was actually getting ready to go up to meet the client. That was my impression. Now, I think when Mr. Rubenstein was asking you questions, you said, um, um, that you were somewhat surprised that she had decided to meet with some clients because she was so eager to get home, right? Somewhat surprised, not unusually surprised. Okay. Just it would, you know, stand a reason in someone's head. They would say, oh, I, you wanted to get home to the kids. Okay. That's all I thought. But, in fact, you were somewhat supportive of her seeing a couple clients, right? Um. I didn't tell her what to do. She, that's what her intentions were. That's what they were. Okay. But you thought that it would be good that she could make up some money, right? Probably. Money that she had missed out on that day from hanging out with you. I know that she would have to sacrifice financially to be able to meet with me all afternoon, yes. Okay. So taking a couple calls before she got home to her kids helped her recuperate some of that money. Correct. Okay. Now, prior, I think you had told Mr. Rubenstein that prior to her disappearance, the two of you had gotten back together, right? Correct. So that means that your relationship, you, I mean, you obviously hadn't remarried, right? No. But you were back together in the sense that you were seeing each other, right? Correct. And, and dating? Um, well, it wouldn't be dating after you've known somebody that long, so okay. we were just... back together. Yes. And you had been spending time with her, obviously. Yes. And when you spent time with her, she would have both of her phones with her, right? Yes. And you indicated they would ring. Yes. And they would ring a lot. Um, depends on your definition of a lot. They would ring frequently. Okay, frequently. A few an hour, a few calls an hour. Okay, throughout the whole period of time you're spending with her. Probably. And so nothing, so similarly on June 28th, her phone was ringing a lot. Yes. And it actually seemed to you that it was ringing more than usual that day. Uh, 
I, I don't know about more than usual. Okay. I mean, just like when anyone's trying to spend time with somebody, it's irritating when the phone keeps going off. Okay. But, again, when you spoke with that investigator in July of 2007 down in Aurora, you indicated to him that it was even more than normal. It might have been. And that you even commented to Ms. Bergfeld that that was even a lot for her that day. I might have. Okay. Did you, um, <coughs> so you don't remember telling the investigator that? I remember mentioning it, but I mean, whether it was ringing a whole lot, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know how to, if that's a lot or not. Okay. But you testified before that it was a lot. I would say it's a lot, but not an outrageously amount of calls coming in. Okay. I mean, your typical business phone, how it would ring. Okay. <clears throat> Especially if your business phone is for an adult entertainment business, right? They tend to ring a lot. Okay. So I think we've established that Ms. Bergfeld's phones ring a lot, or her Model Zinc phone rings a lot at least, right? Correct. And on that day, it even seemed to you more than normal. Okay. You agree with that? I agree. And it's your understanding that most of these calls was from one person in particular. I don't know that for a fact, but um, I think there was a, a call in particular that kept coming through. Okay. And you would, it was your impression that there were actually excessive calls from one person. I believe it was. And it was also your impression that one of the clients she was about to see was a client that she had been ignoring all day. I just remember um, a feeling of aggravation that it was the same person that kept calling and they were, um, if you would say, a pushy type of client that okay you know, doesn't like to be ignored too long. Okay. You know, I mean, if anybody's eager to want to see somebody, they're going to keep calling. Sure. But this was a little excessive to your mind. Yes. Okay. And was it your impression, though, that one of the people that she was about to see was that excessive client? I knew that was the one that was most anxious to have a return call. Okay. Well, is it, it's Beigler? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Beigler, you testified in this matter before, right? Correct. And you testified before that it was your impression that she was about to see a client she had been ignoring all day. I can't say for sure if she was going to see a particular client she was ignoring all day or she was going to choose somebody else to pick sure, to go see. Right, of course, but that's not the question I'm asking. The question I'm asking is about what your impression was. That I would say yes, that was probably my impression. So would you agree, Mr. Beigler, that you know everything about her Models, Inc. business? Yes. And that you knew everything that was going on with the business? Yes. Despite that, do you still believe that she was just doing massages? Yes. Okay. Do you believe that she was not having sex with anybody for money? For money, no. Okay. That she was having sex with people for free? Um, if so, somebody can choose to do that if they want to. Okay. But in terms of the Models, Inc. business... I'm saying there would be a a line between a paying client and somebody somebody would choose to have sex with. Okay. I mean, whether you're in the adult or entertainment business or not, you might choose to take on a lover, you might choose to only get paid for it. All right. And in terms of Ms. Bergfeld, specifically in her Models, Inc. business, it's your understanding that in the, in the realm of her Models, Inc. business, she was not being paid for sex. 
she was getting paid for sexual companionship as far as intercourse is concerned. I don't believe she was having intercourse for money. Okay. And you believe Ms. Bergfeld to be actually pretty conservative? Very. And that's why you find it hard to believe that she would be engaged in prostitution. It depends on your definition of prostitution. An escort is prostitution to a certain extent. Everybody that's in that line of work draws their own boundaries of, of what they'll do for money. Okay. And you whether it's stripping, whether it's full-blown street prostitution, every individual's gonna have their, what they will do and what they won't do. And you thought that Ms. Bergfeld's boundary was that she wouldn't have sex with a client? Yes. Now, is part of how you know so much about Ms. Bergfeld's Models, Inc. business because you and Ms. Bergfeld were actually working on starting up a Denver franchise? Yes. So, I think you had told Mr. Rubenstein that she was trying to get you to dance, but that was it? Um, no, actually, I just didn't, I didn't want to do any um, group things, bachelorette parties. I didn't want to do anything like that. Okay. One-on-one -on -one escorting I would do. Okay. I wasn't interested in any of that party stuff or driving to Grand Junction to work. So the two of you, since you weren't willing to come to Grand Junction, the two of you were working on starting up, a, starting up the business in Denver together. Yes. And you indicated that one of Ms. Bergfeld's business was that she had a couple rental properties. Yes. And that was in Denver. Yes. And was she actually working on setting up those rentals as an in-call location? Not at all. She was paying contractors to renovate them, and we would go by and check on the progress of the renovations. There was never any intention of using them for, for um, an outcall house. I don't know where you got you heard that. Oh, yeah. Was she? But she was in the process of trying to recruit more women into her business. Um, not necessarily. I mean, maybe a a couple. Okay. So she was working on getting a couple more women. Sure. So this, I want to talk to you a little bit about your phone. You said you got a new phone the day after she went missing, right? Yes. And the phone number that Mr. Um, Mr. Rubenstein asked you about, that 720-404 number, that was your previous phone. I don't know what was the new number and what was the old number. May I approach the witness? Yes, you may. Thank you. here what's marked as defendants exhibit A and B for identification purposes. Um, A is an ad from Backpage.com, right? Yes. And it is 
advertising erotic services, right? Correct. And it has both your phone number and Ms. Bergfeld's number, right? Yes. And then similarly, here's a Yahoo search for a Craigslist ad, right? Yes. And that also has both of your numbers. Yes. I'm sorry, is, is it a D and a Craigslist? Yes, I'm sorry. Now, also being familiar, also being familiar with Ms. Bergfeld's, um, the Models Inc. business, you're aware that she did not use security, right? Yes. And so that means that she went out and met cl clients all by herself? Correct. In this line of business, other prostitutes and escorts do sometimes use security, right? Maybe some of them. Some of them do. Okay. Not all of them. Not all of them. Right. Obviously, Ms. Bergfeld didn't. No. So that um, the sometimes people use security, obviously. It means someone else goes with them, right? Yes. And so it's safer, right? Yes. Theoretically, that's why someone uses security. Is that the case? Yes. But Ms. Bergfeld didn't think that anything would happen to her, right? She didn't think anything would happen. Okay. And that she thought anything that would happen to her, she could talk her way out of. Yes. So she didn't need security. That wasn't her reason for not needing security. Um, she just didn't. She was independent. Okay. And you have to pay your security guy, right? I suppose you would. Okay. So if she didn't use security, then she could just keep all of the money for herself. Yes. Um, and she's willing to take the risk. I don't think she looked at it as a risk. Okay. She didn't see any clients as harmless you or harmful. Harmful, okay. But you understood the risk, right? Yes. And at the same time that Ms. Bergfeld didn't use security, it's also your opinion that she had a talent for, quote, milking men out of money, right? Yes and that it's your opinion that she knew how to identify men's weaknesses and exploit them. Yes. You've heard her take calls on her model, or you heard her take calls on the model's Instagram, right? Yes. And so you, um, you understand that when she answers the phone, she acted like an operator? Correct. Or maybe a dispatcher? Correct. And by that, we mean that she would Tell the men what Objection, kind of hearsay. Go ahead and respond to the objection. Um, I don't. I don't think it's hearsay. I'm not asking for a um, assertion or a statement by Ms. Bergfeld, but more how she would um, portray the call and act on the call. Okay. I don't know the basis for that knowledge. If it's something that was told to him by Ms. Bergfeld, for example. So I'm sustaining the objection based on a lack of foundation, and you're admitting it for the truth of the matter asserted, so it would be hearsay. Okay. But you can rephrase and uh, try to establish personal knowledge. Okay. Well, Mr. Bygler, I think I'd already asked you if you listened to, you heard Ms. Bergfeld pick up her model team phone. Yes. Okay. And, um, so when she acted like she was the secretary or the dispatcher, um, the way she was acting was not like she would be the actual woman who would show up for the man. Correct. And that she would portray her business like there were a lot of women for these men. Objection, to hearsay. Are these actual phone calls that were observed? Well, he did testify twice that he would listen to her answer her model's ink phone. So I think there's a foundation. Well, if you limit the question to his observations. Oh, okay. 
Uh, so the objection is sustained. You can rephrase. Oh, so I'm sorry, Mr. Bygler. So what I'm asking you about is only the conversations you listened to when Ms. Birchfeld answers her model jury question, so not anything that you weren't there for because you can't testify to that, obviously. So in terms of the conversations, the phone calls you heard Ms. Bird, Ms. Birchfeld take on her model jury phone, you heard her portray It was deliberate. It was a, a, you know, a business decision. Okay, to make the. It was deliberate to do that. Yes. Okay, to make the business look really good. Correct. Which she thought established more safety. Okay. Um, but then turns out it was mainly just her and a few other women. Correct. Um, and these other women that she hired, she it was mainly her. Mainly. And she did most of the calls. Correct. Okay. In your experience in, in this um, field, calls with a client last about an hour, right? That's the time limit. Okay. They can also be 15 minutes, though. Okay. So anywhere from 15 to 60 minutes. Correct. Would you say that the standard is about an hour, that that's the standard? That's the standard. Okay. Now, you indicated to Mr. Rubenstein that Ms. Bergfeld had different outfits for her clients, right? Yes. Now, mainly she just had two outfits, right? I think she just had a change of clothes. Maybe if somebody's specify that they wanted a, a really dressy outfit, she would probably accommodate. Okay, special requests. Sure. But wasn't it your understanding she had a classy outfit and what you called a sleazy outfit? Yes. And her, we talked about this a little bit before, but her habit would be to change before she saw a client, right? Correct. And then change again before she came home? Yes. And so obviously all this changing happens in her car. Yes. All right, now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about reporting, or figuring out and then reporting that Ms. Bergfeld was missing. You, okay, so it was your, okay, Talk to, you heard Ms. Bergfeld talk to her daughter when you guys were together on the 20th, right? Um, I think I remember them talking. Okay. And you remember that Ms. Bergfeld said that she would be home for dinner? I believe so. And that didn't strike you as odd that you're leaving Eagle at 7, almost two hours after dinner time, and she was expected to be well, dinner for them could have been a lot of times, and sometimes client, she can take care of a client in 15 minutes, so it wouldn't have delayed her enough to, for it to matter. Okay, so maybe she was having dinner with her three young children at 9 p.m.? Um, either that or she would tell have told the nanny to feed them. Now, you, after you got off the phone with her around 9 p.m., you did expect to hear from her again that night, right? Not really. Okay. I wasn't planning on speaking to her again that night. Okay. Um, and you did actually try calling her on Friday. I might have tried once. I don't think I tried to call her at all on Friday, though. Then why did you tell the investigator in July of 2007 that you did? Well, I probably did then. Okay. If I said I tried to call her on Friday, I probably did. Okay. And you indicated, so you indicated to the investigator you did try to call her on Friday because you, in fact, did try to call her. Okay. Is that true? I might have tried to call her on Friday. Um, either way, I didn't get through, so right. I might have left a message. 
what about um, on Friday you also tried sending her an email? Um, I think I did, yes. Okay. So, I guess too to specify on Friday in addition to emailing her, you also tried calling her on both of her phones. I don't know if I tried to call her on both. I probably tried to call her on one. One of her cell phones? Yes. Okay. And you also called her home phone, right? On Friday? Yeah. I don't remember calling her home phone on Friday. So you don't remember calling her home phone on Friday and talking to Jess? On Friday? Correct. No. Okay. And so then why did you tell the investigator in July of 2007 when he was talking to, an, talking to you in Aurora that you had talked to Jess on Friday? Um, he might have misunderstood me because if, if I were to talk to Jess on Friday and she said her mom hadn't come home, the police would have been notified that night instead of that next day. Okay, right, because if you knew she was missing on Friday, you would have called right away. Absolutely. Okay. And you said you spoke with Ms. Bergfeld every day, right? Pretty much. Would you agree you actually spoke with her multiple times a day? A lot of the times. And so you went a whole day Friday without talking to her? Yes. Nothing struck you as odd about that? No. Did you, in fact, tell the investigator, didn't you, in fact, tell the investigator in July in Aurora that you spoke with Jess and you couldn't identify any, like, stress or panic in Jess's voice? Well, that's how I, because she wasn't, she was too young to be aware of what was going on. Okay. She was just, you know, I mean, they don't, they don't have any concept of a timeline, a child like that. So when I spoke to her on Saturday and she was, you know, just kind of nonchalant about it, you know, that's why I told her to call 911 that something was wrong. Okay. So you think it's normal that an eight-year-old would be nonchalant about her mom being missing for two days? Objection. Relevance. Well, Objection. she wasn't. She Sorry. was worried. I have to rule the okay. objection. The objection's sure. overruled. You can proceed. Thank, Thank you. you. You can proceed. I forgot what I was saying. Okay. So I guess I'm just confused, Mr. Beigler, why, why you think it's normal for an eight-year-old girl who sleeps with her mom every night to be nonchalant on a Saturday morning when she hadn't seen her mom in two she, days. She wasn't aware of the actual gravity of the situation. She was worried that her mom hadn't arrived. That's why she said that she was getting ready to, you know, they were contemplating, you know, going to the sheriff's office or calling. And I told her, you know, if something is wrong, definitely stop what you're doing and call. I think they were worried about the um, legalities of the nanny or something like that. Oh, okay. Before they... She was maybe undocumented, you mean? Correct. Okay, so she can't just go show up at the sheriff's office? I think that's where any hesitation was. What I want to talk to you, I want to get back a little bit more to Friday, because is it your testimony that you did not talk to Jess on Friday? I don't believe I talked to Jess on Friday. Okay. So you don't believe that you talked to Jess on Friday and learned that Ms. Bergfeld had not yet been home? I know that I didn't talk to her on Friday and find that out. Okay. When you spoke with Investigator Ellard, you told him you spoke with Jess on Friday. Objection, she's testifying. Um, if he has that written down, it's inaccurate. The, uh, sorry, the oh, objections are overruled. You can continue. Okay, that would be inaccurate because I know that I didn't speak to either one of them on Friday because Jess would have told me that she hadn't been home yet. And, and I would have upset you. Yeah, I was already, I already had a feeling that something was wrong. I was just in, I was pushing it down, but I knew something was off. Okay. I just didn't want to, you know, make too much out of it yet. So when the investigator wrote in his report that um, you noted that Jess did not appear to be upset or Objection, panicked. Your Honor. She's testifying in a substance fashion, not an evidence. I believe. 
Uh, she's al allowed to orient the witnesses to former statements that could be used for impeachment. That's how I understand it to be. Is that the approach? Yes, sir. Feel free to stretch, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. The previous ruling is vacated and the objection is sustained, but Ms. Smith can rephrase. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So when you called, when you called Ms. Bergfeld's home phone on Friday and spoke to Jeff, you did not detect any panic or upset in her voice. You mean Saturday morning? No, I mean Friday. I don't believe I talked, I didn't talk to them on Friday. Yes. Okay, did you review that report? Not word for word. Okay. Do you, did you review the part where the investigator documented that you had called on, that you said you had called on Friday and did not detect any concern or panic in Jeff's voice? Did you read that part? Um, I didn't read that part. I'm aware of that part, but it, either way, it was Saturday that I uh, talked to her. I can remember it like it happened yesterday. Okay. So if the investigator indicates called on Friday, did not in, did not detect any upset in Jeff's voice, he's got it wrong. I would say that it's inaccurate, yes. Okay. So you didn't talk to anybody regarding Ms. Bergfeld on Friday? Nobody. Okay. A, a woman that you were back in a relationship with? Um... Right, you I might have told her no, because I wouldn't, she wasn't aware of the relationship with Paige. I guess that's not my question. I guess I'm just, um, my question is, is that you agree you were getting, you were back in a relationship with Ms. Bergfeld? Yes. You spoke with her at least once every single day? Um, sometimes, sometimes there'd be a day in between. Okay. And so it's your testimony today that you didn't speak with her on Friday? I absolutely did not speak with her on Friday. Or that you didn't speak with Jess on Friday, I should say. Did not speak with Jess on Friday. All right. Now, when you um, we're interviewing with this um, investigator down in Aurora. You tried to give him as much information as you had, right? Everything I had. Okay, because you wanted to do whatever you could to help him find Ms. Bergfeld. Yes. And so you tried to give him anything you could think of that would be helpful. Yes. And so you told him, you gave him your roommate's n number, right? Or your roommate's My renter, number. I had a renter. Okay. That lived in part of your house? Yes. Okay. You gave um, the investigator that information? Yes. And you also um, gave him information about a woman named Zoe, right? Yes. And that was another one of your girlfriends at the time? Yes. And you gave any, you gave the investigator as much information as you could about any client that you knew of, of Ms. Bergfeld. Yes. And this included some pharmacist client you knew of? It could have. And 
high school friends of hers you thought she was still in touch with? That were clients? No, friends, just friends. Sure. Okay. And then a uh, woman she used to strip with but had a falling out with? Or are you talking about just contacts of hers? Yeah, exactly. Just as much information sure. as you could. Anything I could think of. Okay. And you wanted to make sure that you wanted to make sure that in the investigators knew about Jose, the live in nanny's boyfriend, right? Yes. And because this man also lived with Ms. Rimpel. I don't know if he lived there full time. Okay, but he was there a lot. Yes. And you told the investigators about um, you told the investigators about the email you had written her, right? Yes. Now, you also I want to clarify too. So you obviously that phone call you called the sheriff's office to report her missing, right? Yes. And then you talked to investigators in Aurora a few weeks later. Yes. And you had actually made a report in between there with some information you thought investigators. Yes. It was it was some information that Ms. Bergfeld had given you about a client you thought they should know about. Um, I don't recall too much on that. Okay. Do you recall that your sister helped you make that report? That's what I'm hearing, but I don't remember that too much. Okay. But you do remember making trying to provide the sheriff's office with some extra information between the time you reported it and the time you Yeah, I think it. I was just trying to think of anything in my mind that, right. that they could use. And when something came to mind, you made sure they knew it? Yeah. Yes. So back to um, your relationship with Ms. Bergfeld. It was when the two of you were married that she she met Mr. Dixon, her second husband, right? Yes. And she met him while she was stripping? Correct. And um, right, right before, or what was it, several months before she went missing, you guys had rekindled your relationship? Yes. And you would spend time together in your house in Aurora? Yes. And you'd meet halfway in the Vale Eagle area? Correct. And were the two of you also talking about you actually moving to Grand Junction? Um, she wanted me to move there, and I, were, I was trying to convince her to sell that house that she didn't need to pay that house off. Okay. That the house was what the problem was. Okay. But she, she didn't want to sell it. She wanted you to move into it with her. Um, we talked about it. And the last time you saw Ms. Bergfeld on the 28th there in Eagle, the two of you had sex, right? Yes. And you were very close to her, right? Yes. And you were starting to get attached to her kids? Yes. Did you actually consider yourself to be the closest person to her? Yes. And the two of you were falling in love again? Yes. To your knowledge, Mr. Dixon was not aware of this. I believe he knew. Okay. And what about your girlfriend, Zoe? Was she aware? She knew that Paige was my ex-wife. She didn't know that we were seeing each other again. just have another quick question for you. You indicated that the house was a problem, right? Yes. Meaning that it was very expensive? Um, yes. And because her monthly mortgage was pretty exorbitant? Yes. And so really for Ms. Bergfeld, all, all around money was a bit of an issue. Yes. I have 
nothing else. Thank you. Do you want me to redirect Mr. Rubenstein? Not based on that, Your Honor. No. Do you want him to still be under subpoena? No, sir. He's He can be released from subpoena. Any objection? Um, Your Honor, we still have him under subpoena. Okay. So you, uh, you're still under subpoena, Mr. Beigler, but you're excused uh, at right. this moment. Anyway. This might be a good time for the next one. Sister, okay. All right. We'll go ahead and take a short recess, ladies and gentlemen. Please remember all of the instructions for the recesses that I've already given to you. Thank you so much. Please rise for our jury. For the record, our jury's left the courtroom. Anything before we recess, Mr. Rubenstein? No, sir. Mr. Colvin? No, sir. All right, thank you. We'll be in recess until 11.05, please. Thank you.